So you're in a series that you just finished one in Colossians, and I'm going to teach from Colossians 1 today, verse 9 through 14. Open your Bibles there. I'm teaching from the ESV. You guys might have NIV or NLT. Our church is the same. Uh, the, The Bible is the Word of God, no matter our translation. It wasn't written in English. This section of text talks about the contrast, or a contrast, between light and darkness. A contrast between light and darkness is always aware to us up here in the Northwest every time fall daylight savings time comes. You know, it's 4.14 the day after, and you're like, why does it feel like midnight? (laughs) Yesterday was amazing, and now did we move to Alaska? It's very real, like darkness is set in. I think I need to go to sleep, and you realize your kids aren't home from school. Um, I have four kids myself. My daughter is 13. You can pray for me every single moment of the day. And then my boys are younger. There's three boys. I don't know their ages or their names. They're just down there. They share a room, and they're loud. Um, As a kid, I loved fall daylight savings time. Quick story. My neighborhood friends and I, we loved playing football. And we realized during daylight savings time, they just set the clock back. The powers that be, the government is doing stuff with the time. We don't care. They're just giving us an hour. We would play football for an hour before school. Because it's now bright, we're now rested. So I loved the fall daylight savings time as a kid. I never knew when it was coming. But that time hit where we're like, guys, there's extra light now. Something happened, people are doing stuff in Washington, D.C. Let's meet in the morning, and we would just play football for an hour. Now as an adult, I don't love it as much. But as a kid, that little bit of light made all the difference. My title for us today is, is a little bit of light, or light makes all the difference. Now, unfortunately, I don't need to tell you this, but unfortunately in our world, we have a lot of darkness, and we experience a lot of darkness. Uh, Many different things can cause us to feel or experience darkness. It could be wounds that other people have done to you, actual, tangible things people have done to you. They could be your own internal sinful thoughts and actions. Sin isn't just things you do, it's also thoughts that are happening. A third area of darkness could be Sometimes untraceable, like, but they're just emotions that are in us. Like, where did this rage come from? Where did this frustration come from? You can't even trace it to a thought or to a, something in history, but man, these emotions. So darkness is all around us. And with that, let me read our text to give some, the, the contrast between darkness and light our text speaks to. Verse 9, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So uh, Paul and Timothy are praying for this church in Colossae to be filled in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That you'd be, you're being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. For all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father. Here's the light and the dark piece. Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light? He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you for your word. I pray that it would shine this morning. Thank you that even though us in this room are not friends yet, that we get to be saints and light together. Thank you for the church in Auburn and the surrounding areas If people live in Kent or, or Bonnie Lake or Sumner. Thank you that your church is here, God, in this region, and we get to be your light. In Jesus' name, can you say with me? Amen. 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 All right, in way of uh, summary and setting up this morning, I'm going to teach eight things that God has done according to Colossians 1, 9 through 14. Now, a good friend of mine who pastors a church in California, he always tells me you can only have three points. He says, the people like three, three is a number God likes, you just have to have three. He says, don't worry about it. Well, this is flies in the face of my friend from California, because I will have as many points as I want. Uh, Eight points, it's I'm just slowing down and I'm looking at the text, and I'm drawing a point out from each verse. The first point, this first thing that God does for you, I'm going to say it that way, is God has made himself able to be prayed to. 
Verse 9 says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. So God has revealed himself in a way that the Apostle Paul and Timothy can say, hey, we're actually speaking to God on your behalf. Amen. That is, God has revealed himself in a way that says, yes, plead with me. He can be petitioned or appealed to. The second one is similar to the first, but verse 9 kind of makes it clear that God has made himself obtainable. Verse 9 says, we're praying for you. We're asking that you may be filled. So by obtainable, I mean God fills people with himself. Amen. Asking that you may be filled with what? The knowledge, so there's some information going on in our brains, of his will though. His will is his kingdom, his goodness, who he is. That you may be filled with the knowledge of that and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let me say it like this. Before we had engines, we still had boats. And how were they powered? By sails and wind. That's all that I know about boats, so don't ask me any more questions, but I know that. And the wind that would enter the sails of the boat would be its source of power or energy the entire time. It wasn't like we got one sudden gust and that was enough. We have, you know, a backup spare battery that's now able to take us. No, they needed, they, they were dependent upon the wind to fill the sailboat. God is able to fill you in the same way. And with that, we, there, there's ongoing filling. Where he is, he is obtainable. And the, the opposite would say, he's not unattainable. God has made himself where humans can be filled with the God of the universe. The third thing is that God can change how you live. He can fill you. He can draw near and then change. You guys heard that in the scripture in verse 10. That you may be filled so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now, this isn't like the type of stride that you do. You know, are you fast walker, slow walker? Do you do like the, the leg thing that no one understands? This isn't how you walk. This is your life. This is the fruit of your life. So as to walk in a manner worthy of, connected to, aligned with God's kingdom, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is amazing. God can change your life to bear healthy fruit. Amen. What's another way of saying fruit? Like it's tasty. It's good. It's purposeful. I have a neighbor behind me and they have four fruit trees that like carry over into our yard. And Brian knows this. Two of the fruit trees are good fruit. Two of the fruit trees are just really bad. It's like, well, that's an apple tree, but it's kind of not because they don't taste like apples. So just don't. Other than my dog, no one eats from that apple tree. I have a very dumb dog. This is recorded. I'm sorry, dog. Um, so God can change your life, how you live. The fourth thing, and I'm building upon this. See, the Apostle Paul, he has these run-on sentences, which for us today, we're like, well, slow down. Well, let me catch what you're saying. And it's because they're all building upon themselves and making many points, but one ultimate point. So these are building upon themselves. God can impart strength from outside of yourself. Verse 11 says, being strengthened with all power, according to your glorious might. No, according to his glorious might. God cares so much to give might that is external of yourself. Oftentimes, darkness is so thick like a cloud, it's so heavy, that we don't have might in and of ourselves. God can impart strength. The fifth thing is God can empower long-suffering. Verse 11, being strengthened according to his glorious might for all endurance, and patience with joy. The glorious might that God gives, it allows you to suffer well. If we took a poll here and we said, who here thinks suffering sucks? It would be 100% yes. It sucks. Doesn't take a lot of Googling or research. But this life is filled with it. So what do we do with that conundrum? What do we do with that reality? That life is filled with suffering. It's part of the darkness that we're in. Our text says that God empowers long-suffering well. Endurance and patience with joy. Not your circumstances are going to change. No, he's going to change you in the circumstances. And we have these things, endurance and patience with joy, from his glorious might. So joy in Christ does not mean that everything is going the way that you laid it out to go. Half the time, you're the problem. The way that you laid it out to go is darkness and God's helping you, taking you out of that. God empowers you to suffer well is documented in this song. 
this hymn that says, when peace like a river attendeth my way, or when sorrows like sea billows roll, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Christ has joy that goes deeper than any of your circumstances. How do I know this? I went to Washington State University, so if you watch football, you know that I'm suffering right now, but I am suffering well. I know, it's so sad, I know. God imparts the sixth thing is thankfulness. There you go, Thanksgiving. I wrote a Thanksgiving message. Verse 12 says this, that God says, remember they're, they're praying for them to be filled with God's will, to be filled with his glorious might, that it would change their fruit. And that, verse, four, uh, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. God's glorious might works in us to make us thankful. The Apostle Paul is saying that God does this. You don't need to muster up thankfulness that God is actually working in you if you've been saved by faith in Jesus Christ to make you the fruit that's coming out is thankfulness to God. The darkness of our world fuels the opposite. Complaining, ingratitude, entitlement, discontentment, wanting, 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 wanting. And all of this discontentment, all this complaining, all this ingratitude, it steals. It steals from humanity. It steals from our society. It steals from our relationship. It steals from ourself. Complaining steals. Entitlement steals. And in the midst of all this darkness, God gives. He gives thankfulness. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit living in and residing in us, God infuses hearts that used to be darkened that would complain, and he transforms them to be hearts that are thankful. That is, he changes the lenses in which you see the world. I told my wife in Coles on Black Friday, I saw a Husky shirt. I said, babe, if we can't beat them, should we just join them? And we met at Washington State. So she said, how dare you? And I said, I fully repent. <laughs> Because we hadn't lost yet. That was on Saturday. Instead of complaining and wanting and wanting and wanting, God imparts the ability for our eyes to be changed. But we say, actually, the things of men, this thing right here in my life, the world wouldn't see this as good. God transforms us. Well, this is amazing. He gives thankfulness of real goodness, though, not of fake superficial goodness. All right, point seven and eight. Are you tracking with me? This is good. Should I just close, Christian, or keep going? I heard Christian was in charge. Uh, keep going, thank you. So the last two points are kind of the, the main idea of the sermon, of the message, of what I think Colossians 1, 9 through 14 is saying. It has to do with light, like I told you guys earlier. Point seven, things that God does is God shares his light. He shares it. He doesn't just shine light. Well, we're like, yeah, great, the sun shines light. I mean, my iPhone can shine light. Studies are showing that's not good for you. Um, but like, he shares his light. He shines his light. Revelations goes on to say that when we go to the kingdom of God, that his light, we won't need a lamp. We won't need the sun. His light will be what we have. So he shines and he shares his light. Where is that found? It's found in verse 12. Remember, we're giving thanks to God the Father. Why? Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light? Salvation is a gift of God where he qualifies people living in darkness to enter into light. His sharing of light is the birthing of faith itself where God is shining his warmth, shining his goodness. Romans 5, 8 says God shows his love for us that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. He pursues us. And he God. God qualifies you. He's the one doing it to what? To enter into his kingdom of light. What does qualified mean? It means officially recognized as certified. So doctors get qualified, thankfully. Nurses, teachers, they get certifications. Uh, carpenters. I, I graduated with a communications degree. That means you're just ready for it. nothing. That means just whatever job you can get, go do it. You know, you're not certified for anything. <laughs> What do I tell them, though, Washington State? Just go along. <laughs> My wife graduated as a teacher. She was certified to be a teacher. She went out and found a job right away. I was like, well, are they hiring? Can I, you know, can I come? No, janitor. I don't have a certification like that. But many jobs do, and they're qualified to be in their profession, thankfully, so we know the doctors are qualified. 
Well, how about this? God qualifies you to be a saint in light, not by anything you do, but by what Jesus did on the cross and by resurrecting from the grave and by placing faith in him. We now, even though we experience darkness, are qualified to be saints in light. God shares his light. And then number eight is God guarantees to keep sharing, to keep shining, to keep illuminating light. He has delivered us, verse 13, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, this text is aware of darkness is the problem. We need redemption. That's why every good story involves redemption. In fact, every song has redemption or resolve, or it goes to minor chords, it goes to tension, and then it resolves. Oh, good, unless it's a bad musician, and they're just like, just like my kids on my piano. They're like, oh, the resolve is you stopping. Darkness implies that things are not resolved. They're not redeemed. And darkness is the inescapable reality that we all know. All of our stories, all your stories are different. Brian's story is different than my story. The darkness I experienced just this morning or last night or this week is different than yours. But it's a reality nonetheless that we can attest to. In this world, life is hard due to darkness. Others deeply wounding you, like I said earlier your own sinful thoughts and actions, or often just unexplainable emotions that can creep in, or even a collision of all three. Well, good news, darkness does not have a ceiling, concrete, final grip. Good news, the creator of life has an illuminating light to shine in our darkness. His name is Jesus Christ, and he comes to be light in the darkness. I love that our text says, in him we're redeemed. Our sins forgiven through his death on the cross and through his resurrection, we now can experience and know his illumination. Christ calls himself the light of life. He, Jesus is so creative with his names. He'd always confuse people with his names. But it's written down for us to look at it through the lenses of all the scripture and be like, well, that's, that's amazing. The, the book of John, the gospel of John is, is known as like the gospel of light. So it's a theme traced throughout it. Well, John 1, 5, right at the beginning of John, it says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John the Baptist came to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light. John the Baptist, not the light. And I don't think he looked like the light either. I think he was just kind of like this ball of not looking like the light. He was stinky and he was messy and He came bearing witness about someone who would come that is light. And then John 8, 12, Jesus comes on the scene and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in what? In darkness. That's the inescapable reality of this life that we're in. He says, but we'll have the light of life. So my main idea today is that the light of life, Jesus Christ, shines in darkness. And it does two things for us according to our text. Certifies you in connects you certifies you eternally light like like defines you as light qualifies you as light but also gives you constant light i'll say it this way christ's light means your eternal standing his his light that is shined on you he's qualified you his light means your eternal standing is certified clean without blemish without darkness without sin even though you have sinned Christ's light, secondly, connects you. It means that your days in this present darkness are illuminated by God's light. You're comforted with his presence and guidance. It's what Psalm 1611 was implying, and Jesus is the fulfillment. You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. See, often darkness doesn't go away. And that's not what Colossians 1, 9 through 14 is saying. Just get through this darkness and in a few weeks time, it'll cycle through. You're going to be okay. So the hope is just grip the wheel and try to get through. Singing Carrie Underwood, Jesus, take the wheel. For the record, I love that song. Often darkness doesn't go away. But Christ's light is warmth and his comfort in the pain. 
Often sorrow doesn't go away, but Christ is light in the sorrow. Christ is light in the waiting, in the wanting, in the unknown. Christ's light makes all of the difference. As we walk through darkness, the gift of the gospel is you have Christ, the essence of light. You're transferred by God to Christ's kingdom. This now defines you. This now marks you. His perfection is your perfection. His victory from the grave is your victory from the grave. Even though you and I sin and can think of all of our sin, Jesus Christ took it all on his back so that he could call you a son of light, a saint in light, so that his perfection and victory can be then attributed to you. So you can conclude. You can conclude that today, tomorrow, there might be darkness. There will be darkness. Whether it's political, whether it's relational, whether you went to Washington State University and there's another apple cup not far away. The truth is, there will be darkness. But you can conclude with more certainty that tomorrow, the day after, even today, there is light shining in the darkness. And this is external might from yourself. You don't need to will it. Jesus Christ is doing this in you. He is shining. He is using his glorious might to shine into your life. The light of Christ will keep on illuminating forever and ever for those that he redeems through faith. God the Father through Jesus has delivered you from the domain of darkness and he's transferred you to the kingdom of his beloved son of his light. And so I want to close by inviting you to thank the Father of light. In light of Thanksgiving, perhaps you did that you know, during turkey dinner. Or maybe you haven't. Or maybe you did, but it's just quick and it's like every year. I want to invite you right now in light of this text to thank the Father of light for sending, for giving, for sharing Jesus Christ in his light, for uh, his light to us, for giving us the Holy Spirit which lives inside of us. Would you take some time to thank God gives us new eyes to see where we're like, man, I'm in this darkness, God, and I got nothing to thank you for. Well, number one, him transferring you from the domain of darkness to light is something. That's everything. But there's a ton of implication and application of that where he gives you new lenses to see. And you're like, oh, man, my job, my job really has sucked. But, man, prov providing, God has provided. I don't know what it will be. I would just love to give you some space as I land for you to consider and be thankful to the Father who shares his light. So let me pray, and I'll just leave you guys. Thank you, Father. Will you show us what you've done? Will you incline our hearts to see it, to have lenses to see, man, the Father of light, he's given. Would you give us thankfulness? In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Can we give him a hand? <clears throat> It, is so, it was so amazing just to hear how we're not stuck in that domain, in that kingdom of darkness, but God has transferred us into the kingdom of life, into the kingdom of light through the adoption by Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for bringing that, that word. Well, we just, we never want to let an opportunity get by. What a perfect message for it, where we want to offer you the opportunity to put your faith in Jesus. This is the moment. This is what Pastor Chris was talking about. This is the transference from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You know, we're all sinners. We're all, we've all fallen short of the, of the grace of God and the glory of God. But we have an opportunity to put our faith in him and the faith in his sacrifice, his death, and his resurrection and become Christians and be transferred into that kingdom of light. So would you all, would you all stand to your feet for a moment? And I just want to ask, is there anyone in this room who's, who would say, you know, I've been walking in the kingdom of darkness and with every eye closed and say, I want to walk in the kingdom of light. I want to be transferred. I want to become a Christian. Today is my day. Would you raise your hand in person or online? Yeah, I see those hands. And if you're online, God, raise your hands to God. He sees you too. All right, so I'm going to lead you in a prayer. 
And it goes like this. When, when you become a Christian, you turn from your sins, you turn to Jesus, and you let him lead. Let's all, let's join together as a church. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. I know I'm a sinner, but I don't want to live that way anymore. So I turn from my sin, and I turn to you and ask you to be my Lord, to be my Savior. And Jesus, I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, or if you are just a newer Christian, we have a great resource for you. It's called the Following Jesus Course. You can stop by the table in the lobby. I'll be there um, after service to get a free book and a free course. It's just steps on now that you've been transferred into the kingdom of the light, what do I do? Like, do I just, am I good? No, there's stuff to do. You know, God, God, we're walking with Jesus. We're following him, right? Amen. All right, and if you fill out a Connect card, please drop those in the box on the way out. And we love you guys. We'll see you next week. God bless.